Take your way with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 3. Hebrews, chapter number 3. And the Bible says there in Hebrews, chapter number 3, we had begun the chapter a few weeks ago. But the Bible says there in Hebrews, chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 7. Hebrews, chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 7. Wherefore, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice... Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Now, as we'd striven to cover last week, the fact is that this is pointing back to the time when the children of Israel had been delivered from the land of Egypt. The Lord had then brought them to the promised land, and the Lord had told them to go in and possess the land. And lo and behold, they did not believe God. They did not trust in what God had instructed them to do. And because they did not trust in God, that is where the Lord says there, uh, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Once again, that 40 years was in reference to their wandering in the wilderness because God forbid them to enter in after their sin of unbelief there. It goes on to say in verse number 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said they do all the way err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. I believe that that one portion of it there is with regards to ten of the twelve spies, which the Lord did not allow to enter into the promised land. And he flat out told them, You will wander in the wilderness until you finally enter in. In our day and age today, beloved, there is something with regards to, uh, we know that the term church is somewhat a term which is loosely used. What I mean by that is they are what we call uh, all sorts of churches today, some of them mega churches, some of them small churches, but there is somewhat also of a misnomer with regards to the Lord's, or I shouldn't say the Lord's churches, but the term churches in general. And what I mean by that is so oftentimes whenever people feel like, well, we're going to get ready and we're going to go to church today, there is an idea in the mind of people that when we go to church, we're supposed to come away from church feeling good. In other words, some people feel almost as if that is the purpose of church, that we, we feel down, we feel bad, so therefore we go to church, and every time we do go to church, when we leave that place, we ought to go away feeling good. Now, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the Lord's people should go, to, go away from church every single Sunday feeling miserable. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am stating today, beloved, is any good feelings or good emotions which we have when we leave the church, it must be built upon the truth of God's Word. It must be established, beloved, that our good feelings are not just simply because we've entered in and we've been able to, to see our friends and dance around and sing and yell, lest we could do that in a bar room. But as we leave the Lord's church, beloved, any good feelings that we have, they must be established on the fact that we've been saved by the grace of God, that our sins have been forgiven through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that our feet have been taken off of the road into hell, and our feet have now been placed on the royal route into heaven, beloved. And that is the grounds of our rejoicing. Any other grounds, it cannot just be, well, I, I have a new outfit and I'm excited to go to church and show it off, or I have a new uh, whatever it is, a new necktie, whatever it may be, but the grounds of our rejoicing must always be found in Christ and Christ alone. When we come then to passages such as the one before us today, beloved, this is one of the most stern warnings in all of the Word of God. The Bible goes on to say there in our text, after the Lord had said there in verse number 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said they do alway err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Now, beloved, Take careful notice there where the Lord says that they are erring in their hearts. The greatest problem that people have today, beloved, with the problem with sin, it has to do with it being a heart problem. In other words, at the seat of our affections, beloved, it all depends upon that which we are affectionately drawn to. And the heart of the problem is always where the problem is at. Thus the psalmist had said in Psalms 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Only God has the wherewithal to be able to create a new heart, beloved. We realize to create, it means to make something out of nothing. It is one thing to manufacture something, to take materials which are already there, and assemble those materials together. You've manufactured something. 
It is another thing to make a cake, wherein you take eggs, which are already in existence, and flour, which is already in existence, and water, which is already in existence. And I don't know what else goes in there. A dash of vanilla, I don't know what else goes in there. But the point is, beloved, that is when you make a cake. But to create something means to take something which is not in existence and create that out of nothing. And this is what the Lord does in the hearts of all who will trust in Him. And that is the fact that He will grant unto us a new heart. Many of the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, though they were numbered among God's people as they had come out of the land of Egypt, they had gone through the Red Sea there. And yet the Bible says there, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Now, how is it, beloved? They have been led through the Red Sea. They have been journeying there in the wilderness, and yet the Lord says of them that they have not known his ways. And thus the Lord says, So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now notice there in verse number 12 then. It is a little bit of a transitional verse because the attention is drawn away from those who had come out of the land of Egypt, and now the attention is upon us. Now the light is being shined upon us rather than upon those who have come out of the land of Egypt. As it says there in verse number 12, Take heed, brethren. Now he's, he's addressing those who are professing Christians, and he's saying, Take heed. We realize what this means. It means to be careful, be circumspect. Think about what you're doing. Think about where you're walking. Think about what's going on in your life. But he says there, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. My beloved, may our meditations be upon this verse as we go through it, because as he says there, take heed, exercise caution, brethren addressing those who are saved. Now, beloved, I want us to, to realize this clearly. Uh, would you get me another bottle, please? I seen Brother Anderson drinking out of this one today, and he was all choked up, so I'm not going to drink after him, amen? Thank you, son. Just give that back to Brother Anderson, amen? As the Bible says there, take heed, brethren. He doesn't say, now notice this carefully, he doesn't say, now the group of people which I'm addressing, there's part of you over there, and I'm telling you what, you folks are on the fringe. You're out there, and everybody knows that you're on the fringe. And because you're on the fringe, I'm going to go ahead and give you this admonition. Take heed to those of you who are on the fringe, if you will, of professing believers. Maybe he says there's some of you out there and you're living a worldly life. Those of you living a worldly life, take heed. Beloved, that's not what the scripture says. It is a blanket statement that is made here before us wherein he declares there, take heed brethren. In other words, beloved, it is not just addressing someone that you suspect is backslidden, someone that is away from the Lord, but the writer here, he addresses them with a blanket statement, take heed brethren lest there be in any of you. In other words, as he gives them this warning, beloved, it would do each of us well to take heed and ask ourselves, what is the condition of my heart? It is not the condition of our bodies because we can drag our bodies in the church and our hearts are yet cold and indifferent towards the things of God. But as he tells them there, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. One of the most, uh, or one of the things which caused me a great deal of dismayment at times, we were, I was sharing with someone last night that there's a missionary and this missionary was somewhat of a legendary missionary within our circle of churches. And this man, he was everybody that you would talk to. Some of the men that I respect most, some of the pastors that I respect most here in this country that I know of, they would speak so highly of this man almost as if he walked on water. And after maybe 20 years of service, his wife ended up calling home, and his wife said, told their sending church, their pastor, she said, I want you to know I'm leaving my husband. I cannot live in an abusive relationship any longer, and I can't take it 
and I'm walking out of here. I'm coming home off the mission field. I'm going to get away from him. And as far as I know, we are going to take and go our separate ways. Now think about this, beloved. Her husband was a man, and once again, he that thinketh he standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. I don't want anyone to feel like, boy, Brother Spears, you're sure lifted up with pride as though it could never happen to you. Beloved, it could happen to any of us. But what I am saying is that this man, for all of those years, he was able to travel around to the Lord's churches, churches that we know and love and respect, and after he would spend time in those churches with his family, after he'd spend time with the people and the pastors and all of those places, beloved, and he was able to somewhat hoodwink all of those people, and quite evidently dwelling within him, beloved, was a great heart problem which none of us were ever able to see. This was a man that we counted to be somewhat as an example. And come to find out, beloved, in the privacy of his marriage, he was grossly abusing his wife. In the privacy of his family life, he was abusing his children. Now here's the thing, beloved. The reason that I bring that up, once again, it's not just a ridicule or ostracize a man. But the reason that I bring that up, beloved, is because that we must guard our hearts. The Bible tells us, guard your hearts, for out of it are the issues of life. Now when we stop to think about this idea, beloved, of our hearts, in other words, our bodies will typically follow along wherever our heart ends up going. In other words, what I mean by that, beloved, is to be honest with you, uh, as a pastor, I've been here going on my 14th year, praise the Lord. Amen. You all haven't kicked me out yet. But at any rate, beloved, as a pastor, to be honest with you, it breaks my heart to have to say this, but oftentimes as I will look out over the flock, whenever I see people that during the preaching of God's Word, it seems like that they're on their eye watch or they're reading another book or they're having their own personal Bible study, they're staring at the ceiling, they're staring at their shoes, and they're doing all of these things. Beloved, there are times that as a pastor that that causes me a great deal of concern because I know that typically... Wherever our heart goes, our bodies are soon to follow. The point being, beloved, is that if you come to church and you're miserable in the house of God, and it's not because of me or my preaching, beloved, I realize I'm certainly not a great preacher by any stretch of the imagination. But my point is this, beloved, if you come into the Lord's house and you listen to the preaching of God's word and you find it boring, you, you fellowship in the midst of God's people and you sit back and say, man, I can't wait to get out of here. I'm miserable here. Let me tell you something. You have a heart problem. You have a heart problem. Someone you think say, well, if the church was a better church. No, 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 no. If the Lord added you to this assembly, the problem is not with the church. If you come and say, well, Brother Spears, if you were louder or quieter or more exciting or had more hair, whatever it is, then we would be more content with the preaching of God's Word. No, that has nothing to do with it, beloved. God's Word is God's Word. Whether a fifth grade child will stand and proclaim the Word of God or whether an aged man stands and proclaims the Word of God, God's Word is God's Word. And if you have a hungry heart for the things of God, then you will be fed. There will be something which is said that will be able to feed you and give you spiritual nourishment. Now here's the point though, beloved. As the Bible says there, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, once again, we think of the prodigal son. How did he depart from the father? I believe before he ever departed from the father that the prodigal son, he would sit there. He did not like his brother. He did not like life on the farm. He did not like any of those things. Long before the feet of the prodigal son ever left that farm, beloved, long before he ever walked away from his father and his family, he had heart problems prior to that. Beloved, thus I encourage each and every one of you this day, examine your hearts. Consider your hearts. When it comes to examining our hearts and considering our hearts, this is not something that your pastor can do for you. And we must all be very uh, on guard or aware of this because none of us have the ability or the wherewithal to judge someone else's heart. None of us do. 
I remember one time I was preaching out in Illinois, and boy, there was a man there in the assembly, and he was actually a deacon in the church. They did not have a pastor, and he was the one who would take care of everything. And the looks that that man was giving me, to be honest, I was starting to wonder if he had an unclean spirit. And I thought, boy, the more I preach, the more, more ugly his faces get. And he was sitting there, and boy, he was squirming and everything else. And I thought, what is going on? Is the message really that bad? Is that man, what's going on? Is it my voice? Does he just hate me? Why is he acting like this? And beloved, I thought for sure he must be lost. I mean, he, maybe the Lord's convicting him. Well, I thought I had it all figured out. After the service, he came up to me and he apologized. He said, Brother Spears, I've been struggling with the kidney stones for the last few days, and they're just about to get the best of me. Once again, on the surface, I thought, well, he's cold, he's indifferent, he's backslidden, he hates the Word of God. That's why he's making those faces. It had nothing to do with those things. The point being, beloved, that none of us have the wherewithal to judge another individual's heart. Now, this is not to say that we cannot judge actions, outward actions. But when it comes to being able to judge the heart, beloved, we do not have the wherewithal to be able to do that. The Spirit of God has no problem judging the heart. I believe that the Spirit of God will also enlighten us oftentimes with regards to the condition of our heart. But we must be careful on those things. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, beloved, this is the greatest danger which the individual is facing when their hearts are hardened. It is to depart from the living God. This is the absolute greatest danger. Now, we have already said many times the book of Hebrews is written to a group of people wherein the, the people are finding themselves somewhat in a state of vacillation where they would say, well, we feel like we still need to be offering up Old Testament sacrifices, but then again, we believe Christ is the final sacrifice. We still believe that the Le Levitical law is in effect for today, and they, we also believe that Christ is the end of the law. They were back and forth and back and forth. Beloved, when the Lord Jesus Christ came here upon this earth, lived a sinless and perfect life, and laid down his life there upon the cross of Calvary, he is the end of the law for righteousness' sake. There's no more sacrifice for sins. He is the final sacrifice. If you depart from him, there is no other. There's only one Messiah, only one way to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus, with God, and that is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, even as He says there, in departing from the living God. I've seen sometimes that people will leave the Lord's church and they feel as though that they have killed the big bear. And sometimes they will leave and, and then never, never come back or never join themselves to another church ever, ever, ever. And they will just live out there somewhat in a state of... Uh, in a state of limbo, if we may use that word, and they will feel as though, boy, I'll tell you what, I've walked away from that church and I didn't have to be around that church ever again. Beloved, if that is a good feeling to be away from the Lord's people and you never have to see them again, then you have a heart problem. There's something wrong with your heart. If there's not that longing to be in the midst of the Lord's people, and we certainly in no wise will stand and preach the priesthood of the church. What I mean by that is I'm not saying that being a member of the church is what saves a person. I'm not saying being a member in good standing is what saves a person. But what we are saying, beloved, is that the greatest danger is, as the Bible says, in departing from the living God. When your heart gets cold toward the things of God, then you're in danger of departing. We will always depart first in our affections. It goes on to say there in verse number 13. Now, what is the means which God has given us there in verse number 13? The Bible makes it clear. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest there be any of you, I'm sorry, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. Now, I want you to notice that there, beloved. The Bible says, but exhort one another daily. Now, here's the thing. If we were to call someone up and say, how's your walk with the Lord? A lot of that depends on the tone in which it is said. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Much of that depends on the tone in which it is said. But you see, beloved, here's the thing. While we are exhorting one another daily, you see, if I were to call up someone and I would say, well, You'd better get your heart, with, your heart right with God and you better be in church or else. You know what? That's not much of an exhortation at all. That is somewhat of what we call here a Sister Bertha Better Than You attitude. 
You better get your heart right or else. Beloved, here's the thing. When it comes to exhorting one another, it is a means whereby we encourage one another in Christian love. In Christian love. What does that mean? That means if you call someone up, say, well, we've been missing you in the services. Is everything okay? We, we've just been missing you and we're concerned. Beloved, that is an exhortation of people. But to call someone up and threaten them or bless them out in the name of the Lord, that's not a means of exhortation at all. But instead, that's precisely what will drive people further away from the Lord in many respects. The Bible says there, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. In other words, beloved, tomorrow's exhortations today, they do not do us very much good. Yesterday's exhortations today, they're already done with, beloved. But we as the people of God, we have the obligation, the instructions placed upon our, our shoulders, the responsibility to exhort one another. Beloved, think about the lives that you are in the position to impact. Every one of us, beloved, we all have various relationships in our lives. Maybe one person goes to one grocery store, another person goes to another grocery store. Maybe you're around friends, relatives, family members, children, grandchildren, aunts, uncles. You are around them, beloved. And even with regards to them, we may exhort them. Now, if they're lost, you cannot exhort them unto salvation, but we can take and point them to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the responsibility that lies upon our shoulders. It's not enough just to take and approach someone and be nice to them. Should we be nice? Absolutely. As the people of God, there ought to be a difference in us and those out in the world. But it's one thing to walk up and pat someone in the back and smile and talk to them in a very friendly manner about the weather and then walk away and the individual says, man, they're really a nice guy. That's really a nice lady. It's good to be thought of to be nice, beloved, but that does not get them any closer to the cross of Christ. Now, does that mean then that we get up on our soapbox and we begin preaching to them, screaming, you know? No, absolutely not. But sometimes it's simply to ask them, have you thought about eternity and where your soul will spend eternity at when you leave this place? But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I wonder, beloved, how many of you have seen the deceitfulness of sin? It's quite an interesting phrase there, the deceitfulness of sin. Because on one hand, we can say, well, sin is deceitful in this manner. Uh, the Bible tells us, uh, also in the book of Hebrews, that there's pleasure in sin for a season. So sometimes people will go and they will live in sin and they'll say, well, I don't know what you're thinking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Because you Christians always say that, Sin is a terrible thing. To be honest, I enjoy sin. I'm finding pleasure in sin. Yes, there's pleasure to be found in sin, but it is only a seasonable or seasonal pleasure. It is not lasting. It will not carry on and on and on, but it is a vanishing thing. It will last for a while, but then it is over. But furthermore, beloved, when we think about the deceitfulness of sin... There are sometimes that people will depart from the living God and they will be deceived in the fact they're holding on to their sin and they will be deceived into the fact that they may hold on to their sin and yet in all actuality they're departing from the living God. Sometimes people will take and say, and I find it somewhat of a, a, an ironic expression, but sometimes people will take and say that this is something you can chew on. They will take and say, some people are so liberal that they are legalistic about their liberalism. You get it? I know it's, it's not yet lunch yet, amen. I know we're kind of still maybe waking up. Some people are so legalistic about their liberalism. In other words, some, I, I don't know if you folks have met people, no doubt you have, Sometimes someone will take and say, well, you know what? I can smoke cigarettes all I want to, and I'm still on my way into heaven. Or maybe someone will say, I can, I can go to filthy movies all I want to, and I'm still on my way into heaven. I can do anything that I want to do, and I'm still a child of God. And I'm telling you what, I'm embracing the grace of God. And don't you tell me I can't do what I want to do. At that point in time, they turn into legalists about their liberalism. They'll fight you over it. Well, if they're willing to fight you over it, then they're legalistic about it, you see. It's the deceitfulness of sin. Beloved, there's absolutely not one of us here today 
Who does not have that propensity to fall into the deceitfulness of sin? None of us are above it. Every last one of us could do it. Uh, King David, he fell into that sin, did he not? People could look at David and say, boy, he's a man after God's own heart. God said, brought him in from the sheepfold, made him the king of Israel. And what happened to David? He ended up going to Bathsheba, having a relationship with her, and then having her husband killed. A man after God's own heart. But beloved, the great difference that we always see in true Christians is that godly repentance always enters in eventually into our lives. In other words, sooner or later, the Lord will convict us of our sins and we will come back in a state of humility or maybe sometimes the Lord will call us home. But as the Bible says today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. In verse number 14, the Bible goes on to say, for we are made partakers of Christ. Now notice this phrase with me. For we are made partakers of Christ. What does that mean to be partaker of Christ? Well, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're partakers of the elements of the communion. Furthermore, though, beloved, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're acknowledging publicly, I'm a partaker of the body of Christ. It is only unleavened bread. It is not magically transformed. It is only unleavened bread. As we partake of the cup, we're saying we are partakers of the blood of Christ. Now, here's the thing, beloved. As the scripture says there, for we are made partakers of Christ. Partaking of the communion table, it does not mean that you're truly a partaker of Christ. Now, maybe you say, Brother Spears, how is that? How can that be? Many, many lost people, beloved, they have partaken of the Lord's Supper. Obviously, we don't know that they're lost. But what I'm saying is there are sometimes that there are wolves in sheep's clothing and they will partake of the Lord's Supper, but it does not mean that they're actually a partaker of Christ. But the Bible makes it clear there, for we are made partakers of Christ. Notice that word there, if. If. A condition given. There's a means here, beloved, by which we may know whether or not we are partakers of Christ. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Beloved, we have a doctrine which we refer to as perseverance of the saints. We believe here in our church, beloved, as our sister churches are in agreement with us on this, this doctrine which we refer to as perseverance of the saints, it means that if you are truly a child of God, that you will indeed persevere unto the end. This means, beloved, that if someone makes a profession of faith when they're 20 years old, and lo and behold, they're 20 years old, and they fall out of church, they fall away from the Lord, and they live to a ripe old age of 90, and they never have any desire for the things of God ever again from the time that they're 20 or 21 years old all the way up until they die at 90 years old. They never have an affection for the things of Christ. They never have an affection for the Word of God. They never have a love for the people of God. Then that means that they were never partakers of Christ. They never were. It doesn't matter how many tears that they have shed. It doesn't matter how sincere that their profession was on that day that they made it. But beloved, there is a continuance which is involved in the Christian life. And if Christ has indeed, as the Bible says, our brother had read it earlier this morning, that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Beloved, what this new creaturehood that is bestowed upon us from God, it is this thing that we desire God more than anything else in our lives. And if we can walk away from that without any grief whatsoever, then we were never partakers of Christ to begin with. Now, we must be careful. Someone misses a Sunday service, and lo and behold, you call them up and say, you missed a Sunday service, so you're not a partaker of Christ. You better be careful with that. As we'd seen last Wednesday evening in the book of Jonah, the, or I'm sorry, Job, the end will tell the story. Will it not? Watch an individual's life. The end will tell the story. The Bible goes on there in verse number 15 to reiterate once again, while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice. Very pointed question for you today. Do you hear the voice of God in your hearts this very day? Do you hear it through the words of God? Are you sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God? Do you hear him? Do you obey him? Do you pay heed unto his word? As it says there once again, and it makes, it makes the notation there, while it is said today, 
Beloved, we had spoken in depth last week with regards to that phrase today, it is not tomorrow. If someone is here and you feel like, well, tomorrow I will make a f profession of faith in Christ. Tomorrow I will serve the Lord. But as for today, I'm not going to do it. Beloved, we do not know that tomorrow will still be the age of grace. We do not know that tomorrow will still be the day of grace. We do not know but what the day may come to an end and the Lord will be finished in the day of grace. Beloved, as the Bible says today, if you will hear his voice, and it goes on there once again, the same phrase that we had already read, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. What is it when we harden our hearts, beloved? It is when we hear the word of God, and the Bible is saying today, 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 and we will sit back and say, no, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. What are you doing in that instance, beloved? You're hardening your heart towards the things of God. You're putting it off, beloved. The Spirit of God is placing His finger on something in your heart, and you're saying, no, I refuse to listen. No, I refuse to obey. What's happening there? You're hardening your hearts. They get harder, and they get harder, and they get harder. With each passing day, it's much like a callus. Each day with a rejection of the truth of God's Word, then that callus gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker to where eventually there's no sensitivity left in that patch of skin. Same in the spiritual realm, beloved. Whenever we harden our hearts and we continue to reject what the Lord is telling us to do, what's winding up happening, beloved, is we are quenching the spirit of God's working in our lives. The Bible goes on to say in verse 16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... In other words, beloved, as we all know, there was a mixed multitude which came out of the land of Egypt. There were some people who were truly followers of God. There were some people who simply got in with the crowd and they just followed along with the crowd and they were basically along for the ride. Beloved, I believe that every one of the Lord's churches has always had individuals such as this on their membership rolls. Maybe you say, well, Brother Spears, the, the good churches don't or the good pastors don't. Well, I would find that an amazing thing because out of 12 apostles... Only 11 were genuine believers, and one was a devil. Did the betrayal of Judas of Christ, did that take Christ by surprise? Absolutely not. Christ knew all the time that he was the son of perdition, but I believe that the Lord left that there in the Scriptures and allowed it to work out that way to the end that we would learn, beloved, that oftentimes that there are tares among the wheat. For someone they had heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved? Now, beloved, this is a question that we need to be concerned with. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? In other words, if we're truly people of God, if our hearts are sensitive to the leading of God's word, we need to take and have our ears perked up when the Bible says, but with whom was he grieved? Because it ought to be our heart's desire to never, ever, ever grieve God, to never grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. And it goes on to say there in verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. But of it in our, all of our hearts, it is of utmost importance that we be in a state of examination and ask ourselves, do I have a heart of unbelief within my bosom? Or have I finally come to rest in Christ and Christ alone? Do I have that heart of unbelief? Am I willing to follow Christ with no reservations whatsoever? Will I obey him? Will I go where he tells me to go? Will I do what he tells me to do? Will I say what he tells me to say? Or will I rebel against that? Beloved, as we'd mentioned here a few weeks back, the sin of unbelief, it can be such a subtle sin. Let me show you how this can affect Christians, beloved. And I find that this is one of the most damaging effects of a heart of unbelief in the life of Christians. When we come to the place that we get all bent out of shape about the condition of this world, and we'll take and say, man, Politics are wicked and politicians are the ones that perpetuate it. I don't know what's going to become of our country and we feel as though we're going to uh, 
uh, we begin to run with the chicken little syndrome that the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and I didn't know what the future is going to hold. And man, I'm telling you what, I could just weep over what the future holds for my children. I didn't know how any of us are ever going to survive these things. Beloved, should children of God be concerned about the political affairs of their nation? Yeah, we should be concerned. But we should never come to the place that we begin to live our lives as though the Lord has stepped off of the throne and politicians have taken the throne of God. What I mean by that, beloved, is that we as Christians, we have the promise, numerous promise in the Word of God, probably one of the most familiar, Romans 8 and verse number 28. For we know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, if we really believe this, it would alleviate a lot of our stress and a lot of our fears and a lot of our anxiety and a lot of our concerns if we really really believe this but where the deceitfulness of sin enters in is when we come to the place that we feel as though well I know the Lord's in control but I have to worry myself sick over this I have to go out and get me a prescription of nerve pills to be able to deal with the state of our government today not saying that there's anything wrong with nerve pills when and where they're needed don't misunderstand but what I'm saying beloved is that that confidence that our God is in absolute control that confidence that our God will always love us if whenever we commit some sort of a sin in our life, any sort of a sin, and we somewhat draw back and we feel as though, well, God is angry with me, God is mad at me, so I better go hide under the pew somewhere, or I better lay out, I better not go around, I better not let the people of God see me because of the sin that's been in my life. Beloved, you know what this is? This is a heart of unbelief as to God's willingness to forgive us of our sins. It is a heart of unbelief with regards to God's unconditional love for us. If we get up one morning and we feel as though, well, I, I did something last night or I said something last night or I watched something last night and I know God's mad at, we, at me today and we walk on eggshells all day long, beloved, this is a heart of unbelief. Get in your prayer clothes and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. Please, dear God, forgive me. And the Bible says that if we will confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Beloved, this is a blessed promise from the word of God. But the problem is that there are times that we will have that heart of unbelief and we, we will feel as though, well, I, I better not go to the Lord. You know what? I've committed this sin already 10 times or 12 times or 100 times. or I've already committed this sin a 1,000 times in my life. And I know I, I'm too shamefaced to go before the Lord. Surely I've reached the end of God's patience and long-suffering with me. Beloved, you will never reach the end of it. For his children, beloved, you cannot exhaust the love and willingness of God to forgive his children of their sins. For any who are here this morning and lost, beloved, the same promises go for you. As we oftentimes quote almost every sermon, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is a promise of God. It's an absolute promise of God. Beloved, we have all been around. We, I know years ago there was a group called the Promise Keepers. It sounds really good, but I suspect that they were made up of human beings. And you know what I know about human beings? They're not always promise keepers. But we have a God in heaven who always keeps his promises. We have a God in heaven who is always true to his word. And as he extends that invitation to all of the lost, Come unto me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's sincere in that. The question is, will we come to him? And if you say, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to come to him, you know why you won't come to him? It's because there in the bosom of your chest is a heart of unbelief. And we must come to that place, beloved, in our lives. And once again, I find that we have a track, I believe someone had printed called The Believer's Paradox, tremendous track. And it was written with regards to the man who had cried out to Christ, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Is that not a peculiar saying? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And yet if we will be honest with one another and honest before the Lord, this is where we oftentimes find our dwelling. We find ourselves in a dwelling state of, of believing in God 
But yet sometimes the evil heart of unbelief will rear its ugly head in our lives. Beloved, it is when we have full confidence in God and his promises that we will walk like and live like that we truly embrace them and we will live like that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not because of ourselves, not because of our good works. You look at your good works, it won't take any time at all. You'll be discouraged. But we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Will you trust in him this day? Will you simply believe the promise of God? You say, Brother Spears, I don't understand how he could forgive me time and time and time again. I mean, I'm not like that because you're not God. God's different than we are. And he's able to forgive time and time and time again. Beloved, continue to look unto him. Will you trust him this day? Will you look unto him? Will you take and say, I'm sick and tired of this heart of unbelief ruling my life? And I simply want to cry out to the Lord, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. He will save your soul, dear lost person. He will save your soul. Dear Christian, if you've been living in misery, let me tell you something. There's joy to be found in the Lord. Joy to be found in serving Christ. Make sure that your heart is right before him even this day.